Good evening, everyone. My name is Lin Xialiang. I am the director of the Confucius Institute at UC Davis. On behalf of the Confucius Institute, who is a major sponsor of this event, and the Department of Food Science and Technology, I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you, students, staff, faculty, and community members, to this first uh, presentation, Origins of Chinese Food. We are delighted to see so many of you here tonight. Uh, before we start, let me welcome Vice Provost Bill Lacey, who also chairs the Confucius Institute uh, Board of Advisors to say a few words. Welcome. Well, good evening, and let me add my welcome to you all. We're really very pleased to see such a, a, a broad turnout for this inaugural Confucius Distinguished Lecture tonight. I chair the advisory board, and this is a unique advisory board for Confucius Institutes. As many of you know, there are over 400 Confucius Institutes worldwide, but this is the only one that focuses on Chinese food and beverage culture. And as a consequence, we've created a board of advisors to provide the expertise. So we have the chair of the Food Science and Technology uh, Department on the advisory board, that's Michael McCarthy, the chair of uh, Viticulture and Enology, David Block, the executive director of the Robert uh, Mandavi uh, Food and Wine Institute, that's Claire Hassler Lewis, the chair of the East Asian Language and Culture Department, and that's Michelle Yeh, and then the chair, of, or the dean, actually the new dean, and we're pleased that Helene Dillard has joined our, our board as well, the new dean of the College of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences. We also have three key partners with our partner university in China, that's Jiangnan University, and so the vice, the vice president, my counterpart there, is the, is the co-chair of our advisory board, and we have two other faculty members, actually one who was uh, Charlie, Charlie Shoemaker's former graduate student who serves on that, on that committee as well. So together with Martin Yang and with Charlie and I, we have worked over three years to open this institute, which many of you know opened with a grand celebration uh, last September. So we're in our first year, and we're delighted you're all joining us today. So I'll turn it back over to Lin Xia. Thank you, Bill. As Bill mentioned, uh, this evening's presentation is our first in the Confucius Lecture Series, where we bring the distinguished guests, like Professor Anderson, to deliver the public lectures. Uh, as this is we, uh, if you're interested in our event and the programs, you can go to confucius.ucdavis.edu. Our programming include uh, weekly tea and conversation, monthly Chinese cooking workshops, and also culture lectures and tea lectures. And we also organize special events uh, such as Chinese New Year celebrations. There are several forthcoming programs. Uh, next week, we have uh, Chinese Culture and Language Day uh, with, we are co-sponsoring with the Department of East Language and Culture Studies. And we are also going to have, in September, we are going to celebrate the 10th anniversary with all the Confucius Institute in the world. Uh, I hope that uh, you hold your date in September. I don't want to take too many time, too much time from the speaker. Uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Charlie Shoemaker to introduce our speaker. Charlie. Thank you and good evening. Well, it, it is indeed a pleasure to uh, be able to introduce our first speaker of the Confucius Institute lectures. Uh, in choosing a speaker for the first lecture, it was kind of a daunting task to begin with, but actually the answer was pretty simple, as uh, it was pretty obvious from my readings, other readings of uh, 
Chinese food culture as we were getting interested in forming this institute and, and actually with our teaching program as well, to have chosen uh, Professor Ian Anderson. Uh, we were just fortunate that he was available and had the time to be able to come and, and do this event for us uh, because he is indeed the, the perfect choice for this lecture in this series and the perfect choice to kick off uh, these events. Briefly, uh, Gene received his uh, BA degree from Harvard University in 1962 with a magna cum laude, went directly to Berkeley uh, and received his PhD there in anthropology as well, and pretty much went directly down to the UC Riverside in 1966 and spent 40 very productive years before retiring. Uh, although only retiring formally, he's been still continually uh, very active. In fact, I think he immediately went up to the University of Washington upon retirement and taught up there for about three years. So uh, very indeed active guy. He has been working on resource and development related issues during his career. His fill is cultural and political ecology with a focus on ethnobiology, which maybe he'll define for us, but also folk classification systems, traditional ecological knowledge, local planning, and management of resources. I think in his own words, uh, I could, would say that he has conducted over, as well, over six years of field work during his career in, in places including Hong Kong, Malaysia, British Columbia, Southwest Mexico, and other areas. So he is indeed a true expert, as we'll see, on Chinese food culture, but he really has expertise in a number of other areas, as well as regions and cultures as well, which uh, we'll uh, had a, a great time talking about some of those today. So without further ado, I want to introduce him, but also mention uh, my first introduction to him was through his writings, particularly he has a very famous and excellent book called The Food of China. And so if you're of interest of this subject, I strongly uh, urge you to go right on to Amazon.com and get your copy. It's a great read uh, and well-written and really uh, loaded with good facts. And he's also written many other books and, and publications as well during his long and illustrious, illustrious career, including one called Everyone Eats, which uh, is, a, is a fun read and uh, informative as well. So it is my pleasure to introduce Gene Anderson to you. And, uh, I'm looking forward to Professor Anderson's uh, talk. I've been looking forward for a long time, so this is indeed a thrill for us. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for having me, everybody. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you for coming out. It's wonderful to be here. I've been to Davis campus several times before. It's sort of a sister campus to UC Riverside because we have a lot of especially agricultural programs that are related. Um, there's an old joke about a history thesis uh, titled The History of British Trade Before There Was Any. Well, this talk is something like that because most of it's about Chinese food before there was China. Uh, I'm going to start from the very beginning and uh, I probably will get up to the rise of the Chinese Empire under the Qin Dynasty that gave it the name, but uh, a lot of this will be before that happened. So this is where it all began, as far as we know anything about Chinese food, Zhou Ko Tien. Uh, there's a cave there which has a lot of people that fell into the hole and died around, you know, 700 million years, 700,000 years ago. Um, and before that, you know, there's, there's a sort of a scene setting to do. Uh, and one other little thing that uh, sort of captures the Chinese attitude toward food and learning and, and an attitude that you should probably all have toward food and learning. The king of Qi uh, found that learning was like chicken feet, that although, even if he ate 2,000 chicken feet, there would always be one more. Uh, so I've always found there's plenty more to learn about Chinese food. Uh, anyway, China began uh, as a chunk of continental crust that's several hundred million years old. Uh, some of the oldest continental crust in the world is in South China. Um, and slowly it grew. And then the real big news from our point of view is that India ran into China several million years ago. India came wandering north from Antarctica for no particular reason, except that it may have wanted to cause trouble. Ran full into China, uh, caused the Himalayas to arise, uh, caused uh, huge fault lines to develop and the uh, earthquakes 
today are, are a result of that, including the greatest disasters in the world, the greatest natural disasters that have affected humans anyway. And uh, the Chinese believe, uh, many Chinese still believed in my early days there that there were dragons in the ground that would shake themselves uh, and cause earthquakes. And they, this was kind of useful for predicting because they found that the dragons shook themselves only in particular places, which were visible as spectacular vertical cliffs and things like that, uh, which we would now recognize as earthquake faults. More sophisticated Chinese science kind of detected lines of energy flow, uh, qi, you know, in the earth, and that basically was correct. They, they are lines of energy flow in the earth, thanks to India still trying to force its way under China. Uh, so basically, uh, about 700,000 years ago, people wound up here. They probably would, were in China before. Uh, they, were, they were Homo erectus at this time. They had brains about half the size of ours. Uh, there's quite a lot of food residue in those caves, nuts and seeds and plant debris and animals of various kinds. Some of it was dragged in there by hyenas. Uh, there's some skulls there that, uh, of Peking, you know, so-called Peking man, Beijing man, that uh, may have been victims of cannibalism, but it looks like the hyenas did the damage, not other humans. So then there's a big gap, and there's several skulls that we don't much know about, but then around 15 to 30,000 years ago in the Ice Age, we have evidence of fully modern humans with fully modern cultures, uh, stone tools, but uh, otherwise very sophisticated people, and they were eating uh, game of every sort and, and plant materials of every sort. Uh, then, uh, the next thing that happened, and when we really begin to know stuff fairly well, is when you start getting uh, agriculture established. Uh, at the end of the Ice Age, the glaciers disappeared from most of China, although there's still a lot of glaciers out there in, in the Tibetan frontier and Qinghai, uh, melting rapidly, but they're still there. And the classic 18 provinces of China rapidly became covered by dense, rich forests, although on the northwestern part there were some sagebrush plains. Uh, the forests were apparently dominated in the north by oaks and related trees, uh, but in the south there was an incredible variety, the greatest variety and diversity of plant life, and for that matter, animal life, anywhere in the temperate zone. And also these are forests that grow extremely fast. These forests of northern Southeast Asia and South China tie up carbon faster than just about any other thing on Earth. So uh, to stop global warming, we could plant more forests there. Uh, so uh, the wetlands were among the most productive areas at this time. There were vast lakes, uh, sloughs, rivers, marshes that were full of fish, turtles, alligators, water plants, and so on, and not least wild rice. So. Uh, Basically, it was a pretty paradisiacal environment, and it was getting more paradisiacal all the time as the Ice Age conditions disappeared and, and things got warmer and wetter and lusher. So this rapid expansion of food should have satisfied everyone, but actually it led to agriculture. Um, many people assume that agriculture must have been invented to uh, provide people with more food. This is quite wrong. Agriculture requires a long period of experimentation during which you're not getting a significant percentage of your food from the agriculture. Uh, so it turns out that all the places we know where agriculture was invented were already quite settled and developed and had a good deal of food. And apparently they were sort of playing with stuff that would yield more faster, probably for purposes of trade. They didn't seem to need it themselves. So for ceremonies, rituals, trade, things like that, they wanted to have a, a handy supply of fast growing food right at hand. Um, anyway, given that trade is apparently a, a big motive, you'd expect the earliest agriculture to be where the most reasonable crossing points for trade routes are, which would be the middle Yellow River and the middle Yangtze River, and that's exactly where you do find them. Uh, in the Yellow River Plains, uh, right around the middle Yellow River Valley, from about where the Wei River joins the Yellow River down into the Lower River course, uh, you got two species of millets, uh, Ceteria italica, uh, foxtail millet, and uh, panicum milliation, which is a uh, broomcorn millet. And these are C4 plants, which means that they grow very well under extremely hot conditions. Uh, they love the heat. 
And uh, so one thing that's interesting about that is that you can very easily tell if people were eating millet because that C4 leaves a characteristic signature in the bone and nothing else that they ate was a C4 plant, uh, at least nothing else they ate any significant amount of. So you can see the bones very slowly rising and you can see also in the pigs, uh, after people domesticated pigs, slowly the C4 rises in the pigs and dogs and so domestication's happening. And so anyway, that's happening in the Yellow River Valley. Meanwhile, in the middle and lower Yangtze Valley, they're domesticating rice. And the first uh, domesticated rice in the world uh, is around 6,000 BC. Uh, there is rice found earlier than that, but it's apparently wild. But between 5,000 and 6,000 BC, you had this explosion of uh, rice growing. So some pretty pictures. Uh, this is from the millet area up in the Yellow River Valley and, and uh, Yellow River drainage. Uh, then here we get to the rice. The Hamudu culture flourished about 5,000 BC in the lower Yangtze River area. And literally bushels of rice have been found in archeological sites. And this was really domesticated. It was already quite diverse. There were several types of rice, long grain, short grain, uh, stored in jars like this. And you can see they were already doing rather sophisticated art that is recognizably like later Chinese art. Um, meanwhile, agriculture is spreading. This is a huge site from way back about 3,3500 BC, uh, way up in Yaoning, up in you know, Manchuria. Uh, uh, goddess Temple, here's the goddess herself. Uh, who knows if she was a goddess or just a local pornography picture, I don't know. Uh, notice that she has blue eyes, jade inlays. Uh, some people think she was a stray European, but what's almost certainly correct is that ghosts have pale eyes, and so she's probably a spirit. Ghost, goddess, spirit, or whatever. Um, we know some more about the religion because here's a shaman burial from uh, Shishui Po uh, Hunan, this is again about 3000 BC, 3500 BC. Uh, they've got his skeleton there, and look at that dragon and tiger. Uh, dragon on his proper right, tiger on his left, uh, iconographically just like modern China. Uh, five, this, this site is 5,000 to 6,000 years old. They already had that pairing, they already had that art, they already had the style. They already knew what dragons looked like, which heaven knows where they figured it out because they're completely imaginary. Uh, they seem to be a cross between a crocodile and an alligator, or between an alligator and a caterpillar. Uh, I mean, you've got to be very creative to think of those dragons, but they were early. So then we get to the earliest city. Meanwhile, uh, before we get to the city, a very interesting thing about language. Um, uh, Peter Bellwood, starting with Chinese data, uh, developed a theory some years ago that uh, languages would spread along with agriculture. And he was looking at the Austronesian languages. The Austronesian people pretty obviously spread from mainland China to Taiwan about 3,000, 4,000 BC, maybe a little later. Uh, you see a very sudden intrusive culture of, of quite sophisticated agri agriculturalists appearing in Taiwan. The Taiwan aboriginal languages are are, are Austronesian languages, uh, very, very separate from each other. They've been differentiating for about la that length of time, and they obviously came in with that movement of people. Well, then uh, the Malayo Polynesian branch of the Austronesian languages just sort of took off, moved down into the Philippines. All the Philippine languages are, are Malayo Polynesian, moved down into Indonesia. Most of the Indonesian languages moved out into the ocean. All the Micronesian and Polynesian languages are all. Malayo Polynesian. It was the most wide flung language file or family in the world before the spread of you know, Europeans to the New World. And so several people got to thinking, well, what about the rest of China? And uh, I think Bellwood and, and an individual named Gustav von uh, Dream, who's a linguist, figured out, and I think quite correctly, that the spread of millet agriculture looks like it maps perfectly from the time frame, the place, uh, everything with the spread of the uh, Sino-Tibetan languages. Chinese, Tibetan, Burmese, that group of languages. Uh, that leaves you about wondering about rice, which is starting about the same time. Uh, 
The, there are several language phyla that are there, Thai, uh, the Thai Kadai phylum, the Hmong, the Yao, uh, Austronesians for that matter. My bet is on the Thai, uh, Thai Kadai phylum. They're in the right place. There's a lot of them. They spread fast. Uh, and there's a lot of very early loanwords from Thai into Chinese for important domesticate and agricultural things. The most famous is chicken. Guy in the Thai languages, and as you know, it's guy in Cantonese. If you know Cantonese, G in Mandarin. G is a derivative in fairly recent centuries from guy. Uh, anyway, it turns out that the Korean and Turkic and Mongol and everybody's words for chicken is all from that. So the chicken got all over with a Thai word for it. So it's pretty obvious who domesticated the chicken, which is native to South China and, and Southeast Asia. So uh, anyway, uh, we turn now to the rise of civilization. This is the first real city in China, early Tou, uh, dating around 2000 BC. Uh, or to be more exact, it was flourishing from about 1600 BC to about 2200 BC. Uh, you can see it's a pretty big place. It had 24,000 people, a very sophisticated culture with uh, uh, highly sophisticated, complicated pottery. There's uh, obvious royalty. You know, some of the burials are very spectacular. Others are just ordinary commoners who didn't get anything. Uh, one thing you find that's a sorry commentary on the human race is that as cultures get more complicated, the, bur the burials differentiate. Fewer and fewer people have more and more stuff, and more and more people have less and less stuff. So if you look you know, a couple of slides back to these guys, they were all buried with three or four of those pretty jars, everybody. Uh, come back here, and these guys are buried. You know, A few of them have a huge a lot of stuff, and the rest are basically thrown in the ground. Um, anyway, uh, early Tou is, is pretty generally identified with the Xia dynasty. Um, if you know Chinese history, you know that the Shang dynasty conquered the Xia dynasty in the traditional date was 1766, which turns out really to have been about 1600 uh, when it's corrected. And in fact, early Tou was the only city in China at the time that, was, that we know to be large. It was indeed conquered by the Shang dynasty. We have both historical documentation of that and clear archaeological evidence. There's an intrusive Shang major city that comes in here. Early Tou is destroyed at that time. The Shang city takes off at that time. Uh, go figure. So I, I think it's kind of pedantic to question the identification of Early Tou with, with Sha. And you see a steady diminution of the glory and splendor of Early Tou culture as you, as you get out from this Early Tou site. So that's where you're really starting to get uh, Chinese civilization. And it was based on millet, uh, millet cultivation. They had pigs, they had chickens. By that time, they were just beginning to get sheep and goats and wheat and barley from the West, but those had not become significant. Um, they did not have things like horses or uh, anything of that nature yet. They probably didn't have water buffaloes. Water buffaloes may have been domesticated in the Yangtze Valley by then, probably were not, we don't really know. Uh, water buffaloes seem to be earliest in India, and it's a different strain of water buffalo, so it's probably a separate domestication. So the Shang Dynasty takes over. Yensha was one of their capitals. Uh, there are still, uh, there's still an awful lot of work to be done on the Shang Dynasty, which was really splendid. They had what many people consider to be the most spectacularly beautiful bronzes ever made in the world by anybody. If you haven't seen them, for heaven's sake, get down to San Francisco and look in the uh, Asian Art Museum there. They're absolutely incredible. You just can't believe it. And uh, they uh, also had a number of uh, fantastic bone and shell technology and so forth. And we also get writing. Uh, the first writing in China, I rather expect that sooner or later somebody will come up with something like writing in the early Tou phase. But so far the earliest writing we have is from the Shang Dynasty. Most of it is on these oracle bones where uh, the king would ask a question uh, about the future and that would get written on these bones and a priest would crack the bone and read the cracks as omens of the future and then write down the answer. And there's cases where they obviously asked the question and got the answer first and then did it on the bone. And, and there's indication that they would also do this on bamboo. And they also used turtle shells. 
Uh, anyway, there's an awful lot of these things, recording a tremendous amount about Shang Dynasty society. Uh, the other way we know about Shang from writing is that they would put little inscriptions on their bronze vessels that they cast, of which more in a minute on a later period. Uh, anyway, here's some Shang Dynasty goodies. Uh, so that brings us through to the Warring States period. Uh, Shang fell to the Zhou Dynasty, and you had lots more beautiful bronzes. Uh, the Zhou Dynasty is somewhat interesting from a recent archaeological point of view because uh, they're finding more and more periodization there uh, as far as food goes. The main thing we have from the Zhou Dynasty is a lot of stuff which I tend to prefer to talk about when I talk about the Han Dynasty because most of the important agricultural, ecological, and food-related texts from, from the Zhou were lost during the Qin Dynasty and then reconstructed in Han. And an awful lot of people, myself notably included, suspect that there was a lot of reconstruction done, if you get my drift. Uh, but anyway, this is Qin Shi Huangdi's tomb, which you all probably know about, this famous uh, tomb that was constructed in uh, you know, very near to Xi'an, which was his capital. Uh, an observation about China, which has something to do with agriculture, but more to do with military strategy, is that uh, Xi'an is at this, and this tomb are in the center of the Wei River Valley, which is right at the center of China. It's surrounded by mountains. It's quite fertile, uh, and basically, through most of China's history, if you could take the Wei River Valley, you pretty much had China because you're in a, in a spot which is very difficult to conquer. The only way you can easily get into it is from the north. Uh, northward, it's pretty barren, desolate, dry country, lots of desert, uh, nomadic herdsmen and people like that. And so it's kind of hard to conquer from the north. And the mountains make it almost impossible to conquer it from outside uh, from any other direction. So most of the time that China has been conquered by anybody, they've started out by grabbing the Wei River Valley uh, as soon as they could get it, and then conquered the rest of China outward from there. Uh, most recently, Mao Zedong, who knew this perfectly well, and, and led the long march from down in southeast China to a cockpit position where he could overlook the Wei River Valley and then take it as soon as he got strong enough. Um, so anyway, Qin Shi Huangdi expanded from there and conquered all of China, thus creating the Chinese Empire as we know it. Uh, so uh, well, of course, I have to show some of the pottery army because it just wouldn't be a talk about China without the pottery army. Um, I'll stay there for a long time, though, because I'm now going to talk about more serious stuff with no pretty pictures. Um, you basically get a uh, long, slow agricultural development, and uh, we really don't know much about when plants were domesticated, except for the millet and rice. Uh, we know that by the Warring States period, you had a very large number of domesticates. Uh, the best source for that is the uh, Book of Songs, the classic anthology of folk songs and court songs that was put together by Confucius. At least it's traditionally said it was put together by Confucius, and we have no reason to doubt that. Uh, you know, who knows, but we, as far as we can tell, that's correct. Uh, it mentions about 55 food plants and a whole lot of animals. Uh, 31 of the food plants were cultivated. The rest are things like acorns and chestnuts that people gathered wild. And you can see in the archaeological record a steady you know, shrinking of the importance of acorns and chestnuts, which are now still a very minor food, as cultivated grains rose. You can sort of understand that people would naturally want to have something that grow, grows fast. I mean, oaks are pretty slow growing, and they don't come into full acorn production for you know, decades. Uh, so, anyway, in the uh, Zhou Dynasty, uh, going back to there for a minute, uh, there's a very revealing bronze inscription from around 800 BCE. Uh, an officer of the uh, government cast it to thank the king for appointing him as uh, manager of the inspectors of the forests of the four directions so that the temple palaces can be supplied. So, first, they're managing forests 
so that they can have a steady supply of large timbers for their palaces. And second, they're paying people so well to do that that they can cast a bronze vessel, which was incredibly expensive. This is really serious forest management. And as far as I know, this is a, a major discovery. It's a recent find. It's the first indication we have that way back in the early Zhou dynasty, they were doing that kind of sophisticated ecological management. Uh, anyway, back to the Book of Songs. You've got 55 food plants, 31 of them cultivated, 93 animal species, and not counting the imaginary ones like the dragon, there are about 90 that were probably used as, well, some of them are insects. So probably about 70 species used for food, including the usual domesticates, cows, pigs, sheep, chickens, and so forth. Um, so uh, there are a lot of ritual texts surviving from this period. As I say, I, I sort of think of them in connection with the Han, Han Dynasty. So turning to the Han, uh, I'm sort of assuming you know what the years are, but you, pay, you probably don't. All right, the, Qing, the Qin Dynasty lasted from 221 BC to 207 BC, at which point it collapsed because you know, the traditional explanation is that the emperors were such unpleasant individuals that people threw them out. I don't know if that's true, but they were not nice guys. Uh, you, don't in, you don't start an empire by being nice. Um, so uh, there was then a, a dogfight between the leading generals of Qin to see who would take over. Uh, Liu Bang finally prevailed and started the Han Dynasty, which lasted much longer, from 206 BC to 220 AD, uh, over 400 years, thus being the longest lasting dynasty in Chinese history. It was interrupted by a couple of coups when other people took over, but the kind of interesting thing is that Han reasserted itself. They took, they, they had counter coups and took the place back. So I don't know how they did it. It's a very interesting example of dynastic strength. Anyway, uh, one thing they sure did was develop uh, a lot of food. Cast iron had been invented during the Zhou dynasty and they uh, perfected that in Han. Uh, at this time, they seem to have invented the wok or possibly got it from India because the woks, you know, very similar pans were, invented, were found in India pretty early. Uh, the cast iron wok probably led to the invention of stir frying. You don't have stir frying in the old texts. It's not mentioned, nothing like it is found. There's no evidence for vessels that could do it. The early vessels are, are clearly about stewing and roasting and grilling and, and barbecuing. No stir frying. So that probably comes in after the wok. Um, and incidentally, uh, another thing that seems to have been invented in Han is distilling. The Chinese had already figured out how to brew what we now call Chinese wine, which is actually ale. It's not wine. It's made out of grain and is made the way you make ale or beer. Uh, and in fact, there is an ancient Chinese ale which has been reconstructed. My friend at the University of Pennsylvania, Pat McGovern, who's a wonderful expert on uh, reconstructing lost alcoholic beverages, reconstructed it, and you can now buy it under the name Chateau Jahu from Dogfish Brewery in Delaware. Uh, it's not that great. It's made of millet and hawthorn fruit. I'll take, you know, barley and hops any day, but, you know, it's pretty good stuff. Uh, so distilling was invented apparently in the Han Dynasty. It may have been independently invented in India, and now there's some thought it was independently invented in pre-Columbian Mexico, but we don't know. But anyway, the Chinese sure had it. And apparently it was just used for uh, medicine on a very small scale from Han till late Tang. But around late Tang and, or uh, just about that time, they developed a way to make a great deal of, of strong alcohol that way. And, and uh, the rest is history, including the rise of Guizhou Motai from costing a dollar or two a bottle when I was in Hong Kong in the old days to costing you $300 a bottle now. I don't think it's changed any either. Uh, but, you know, uh, just like the evolution of Scotch whiskey from what you drank if you were too poor to afford anything else to $200 a bottle stuff. Uh, so the most interesting thing that the Han Dynasty invented, and I'm going to run out of time before I got anywhere near the end of this, but that's all right. Uh, the most interesting thing the Han Dynasty invented was case, as far as we know it, they invented it, was case control experimentation. Uh, they uh, record in a early agricultural extension manual, which is also the first agricultural extension manual in the world, 
uh, that they, the government actually tried these tests where they would sew one plot according to some new experimental technique, and then the next plot according to the traditional method, and then the next plot according to the experimental technique, and the next traditional. Uh, outside of a very funny little reference in the book of Daniel in the Bible, uh, which I won't go into, this is the first record in the world of a case control experiment. And uh, it's certainly the first serious one. So basically the Chinese invented agricultural science, they invented agricultural research and development, they invented the agricultural extension manual. At about the same time they invented the ever normal granary. This idea that you keep a supply of grain on hand for a famine, and the government has a duty to do that. Uh, and so they had that by the Han Dynasty, maybe even earlier, but certainly in Han. And then finally the West got this idea and borrowed it in the 20th century, in the early 20th century, under that name, early, ever normal granary. Uh, we we're kind of slow about some things. And another kind of nice way that they were a little bit ahead, uh, Zhang Zhengjing wrote in the late Han Dynasty, the Shang, uh, Shang Han Lun, uh, Discourse on Hot and Cold Disorders, sometimes translated Discourse on Fevers. It's got uh, perfectly good remedies for berry, you know, they describe berry berry and tell you how you can cure it. They talk about diarrhea and tell you about uh, oral rehydration therapy. Oral rehydration therapy was independently invented in Bangladesh about 40 years, 50 years, about 50 years ago. I've been to the hospital where it was done. Um, the West has had nothing to do with the invention of oral rehydration therapy, which has probably saved several tens of millions of children uh, in the last few, in the last century alone. So, you know, this is kind of a nice example of being way ahead on, on nutritional medicine. Uh, the Chinese were always concerned about this. It was always a huge emphasis of Chinese medicine. Uh, they made a lot of misses. The theories are not perfect, but boy, the hits are really quite amazing. China remained ahead of the West in nutritional science until the 20th century when uh, vitamins were discovered and, and international biomedicine finally pulled ahead. But it's good to remember that vitamins were discovered in Indonesia. Uh, so once, you know, it was, they were discovered by Dutch scientists there, but still, you know, you're looking at a Far Eastern lead on this. So uh, the other thing that's, uh, I'll spare you a whole lot of digressions about medicine, which are truly fascinating. Um, another thing that turned up in, well, several things turned up in the Han Dynasty for the first time. They, they really began to contact the rest of the world in a major way. You'd had sheep and goats and wheat and barley coming in around the early tow period. Horses came in in the Shang Dynasty. We have definite archeological records of them coming in as an intrusive thing with chariot culture, with horse gear from the steppes. Uh, they were, horses were domesticated in Kazakhstan about 3500 BC and uh, you know, transformed the steppes totally, but didn't get to China for quite a while. Um, but then finally in Han, you start getting much more deliberate transfers of more minor things. They picked up grapes and alfalfa from the Western world, uh, via the Silk Road the, across Central Asia. Uh, they're picking up Southeast Asian crops from Southeast Asia and South China, and uh, they picked up tea. Uh, we don't really know when tea first got to China, but it was probably during the Han Dynasty. Of course, now tea is native to what we now call China, but where it's native to is Yunnan and Southern Tibet, which were not part of China till uh, much later. And you know, tea basically is native to Yunnan, uh, to southern Tibet, uh, northeastern India, north Burma, that area. It's a big camellia tree. Uh, it's very beautiful camellia flowers on it. And it's now been dwarfed and kept pruned to a low level. So now you usually think of a shrub, but in its native habitat, it's a pretty sizable tree. Uh, the word tea was, you know, cha was already being used for herbal teas in general, and it just got specialized on Camellia sinensis. Um, so uh, it did not really take off in the Han Dynasty. It seems to have been a very minor drink that people barely noticed. It really took off in the Tang Dynasty from 620 to uh, 907. Uh, there was an individual named Lu Yu who wrote a classic of tea around 750 that popularized it. Uh, and he had very strong opinions on tea. I love his line that, that 
adding flavorings to tea is it makes it into the swill of gutters and ditches. It's a great line. Uh, but anyway, he developed a very ritualized service of tea, which eventually led to the modern Chinese tea service and the Japanese tea ceremony. Um, and in, by the Song Dynasty, you know, later on, in the, around 1000 AD, an individual named Wang listed the necessities for life, which included water and firewood and also tea. By that time, tea was a necessity, not just a drink. This had something to do with the fact that you had to be in court by dawn if you were in any kind of government service. And there has been noted for a long time a dramatic association between caffeine drinks and having to be on the job at an earlier hour. Uh, and that is a serious correlation. I mean, it sounds kind of funny, and in fact, it is kind of funny, but it really is true historically. Uh, anyway, getting back to the Han Dynasty, the thing that really I've been working on lately that's been a lot of fun has been uh, looking at some of these texts from the, uh, that are ostensibly from the Zhou Dynasty and the Warring States period. You know, they're generally texts which are traditionally thought to be from about 300 to 500 BC. But it turns out they were all edited up in the Han Dynasty, mostly around 120 to 150 BC. Most of them were edited up in Hunan, uh, where there was a particularly intelligent branch of the royal family. And they're all strikingly similar, and they all sound an awful lot like early Han texts. And I'm getting more and more suspicious that there was a lot of reconstructing done. The interesting thing about them is that they have a tremendous amount of about agriculture. They've got an extremely sophisticated soil science, just as sophisticated as ours now in many ways. They're extremely uh, knowledgeable about plants and agriculture and food. Uh, they also have some wonderful and mouth-watering dishes. They also claim that the imperial court, as early as like 1000 BC, had 1,000 cooks. Oh, come on. Uh, what they're probably doing is describing the Han Dynasty court, which probably did have a thousand cooks. We know that the Ming Dynasty did. You know, they counted them then, and it probably hadn't changed that much. So uh, uh, the, interest, the most interesting thing to me, being interested in resource management and conservation, is that Han Dynasty, these Han Dynasty texts have a strong conservation flavor. They're uh, directing the peasants not to take fish and birds and stuff and when they're breeding and you know don't take birds in the spring take them in the fall uh, don't cut trees down in the spring cut them in the fall and, and so forth and they have some cosmological reasons for this but it's perfectly obvious if you read the text that it's really about quite conscious uh, resource management and conservation and until recently we kind of thought well that's probably something that never got outside the royal co court then somebody put together a jigsaw puzzle that had fallen off a wall way out in the middle of Chinese Central Asia, really out in Dog City. And when they put it together, it was a royal edict from the court uh, promoting these conservation measures. So even way out there, you know, the, the equivalent of, of Snake Naval Idaho, these things were posted on the walls where everybody could read them. And yes, there was a high level of literacy, even in Central Asia, even in the Han Dynasty. We've got a bunch of soldiers' letters from the same general area, which are really quite astonishing. They're you know, basically very much like soldiers' letters now. You know, dear wife, I'm homesick. This place is awful. The food is terrible. It's cold. Uh, but you know, ordinary soldiers could write. You know, this was at a time when practically nobody in the Western world could write. Anyway, that's beside the board, but the point is that there, there were conservation measures, they were all over the empire, and people could read them. So, uh, anyway, I will, in the interest of time, jump several hundred years and get to the Mongol period. Uh, meanwhile, Western plants and Western medicine have been introduced to China, but that's another story. Um, my historian co-worker and I, uh, Paul Buell, I've been working with him for more than 50 years now. Uh, he's a historian specializing in the Mongol Empire and the, and the Yuan Dynasty in China. The Mongols took China. Uh, they first began to move in on North China in the early 1200s. They conquered all of China in 1279 AD. 
Uh, the Chinese threw them out in 1368. Uh, they went back to the steppes and then continued to harass the Chinese frontier for another hundred years. And that story that China always conquered its conquerors by absorbing them is not true. Mongolia is still a pretty big country. They're pretty tough. They don't feel very absorbed. And uh, as I said, they really were a major power that fought against the Ming Dynasty and on occasion sacked Peking for decades after their fall. Uh, Kublai Khan was the emperor who finally consolidated the conquest of China in 1279. As you may notice from the portrait, he, was, he got pretty fat. He uh, succumbed to the delights of alcohol and food, and I don't blame him a bit. Uh, some beautiful art, just to show you that they had lovely art at that period. Uh, Water Moon Guan Yin. Guan Yin is the Indian uh, uh, deity known in Sanskrit as Avalokiteshvara, uh, which can be interpreted, although I understand that this is not what the Sanskrit really means, as perceiving sounds. So they translated that to uh, Chinese as Guan Yin, perceiving sounds. Um, here she is. She is often portrayed over the water with the moon behind her. I think it's beautiful. So she can stand as a nice emblem of the Yuan dynasty being cool. Uh, and uh, anyway, what Paul Buell and I have been working on is, uh, I should probably wind this up because I'm told I should leave some time for questions. So I'll get us through what Paul Buell and I have been working on. Uh, one thing we did was translate the Yuan dynasty court nutrition manual. Uh, the highest prestige medical officer in the traditional Chinese system was the court nutritionist. And just about the lowest were the surgeons. In other words, exactly the opposite of what we have in the United States today. The Chinese were right and we are wrong. Well, I don't know. I think surgeons are very valuable. But they certainly were right in putting nutrition at the top because, uh, you know, certainly in a country that had as many famines as China did, you certainly want the nutritionist to be up very high. And even today, I mean, heart transplants may look flashy, but they don't really prolong anybody's life very much. They're feel-good things, really. And uh, on the other hand, nutrition, you know how many people are dying from overnutrition and undernutrition and so on. So the court nutritionist in the 1330s was a Turkic Chinese individual named Hu Safwe, and he put together a wonderful cookbook, uh, useful knowledge, you know, or valuable, essential knowledge for eating and feasting, for feasting and drinking, drinking and feasting. Uh, it's full of Central Asian recipes. Uh, the recipes, some of them come from Arabia, some of them come from Kashmir, some of them come from Tibet, some of them come from Mongol Central Asia. Uh, and those are pretty simple, believe me. Uh, some of them are Chinese. It's just an amazing, eclectic combination. And we know why. Uh, the Mongols took great pride in entertaining visiting dignitaries from all over the world. And if they could provide them with their home food or some vague resemblance of it, they were pretty happy about that. It was a display. It was a show-off thing. Uh, the other thing we're working on, and I guess I'll probably wind up with this, uh, Buell has translated uh, kind of a first draft translation. I hope that he'll get around to finishing the, a second draft of the uh, court uh, medical encyclopedia of Western medicine that was assembled at the same time in the 1330s. Uh, about 500 pages survive of a 3,500 page work. And uh, they just got the cream of Central Asian medicine, which had been the major leading medicine in the world from about 700 or 800 to uh, 1100 AD. There was a, a glory period of Central Asia. And they took that stuff and translated it into Chinese with Arabic and Persian drug names. And it's really stunning stuff. And we know it's state-of-the-art medicine as of the 1330s because we've found some parallels to Western practice, you know, what Western doctors were doing in France and in Egypt in the, 13, in the early 1300s, the same stuff. Uh, same description of stroke and, and wounds and stuff, same remedies. So it was the straight dope. Uh, it mentions uh, about 300, and, uh, well, almost 400 identifiable drugs and medicines, many of which are foods, because of course, again, nutrition was the first medical resource. And uh, 
So we've got quite an amazing textbook of, of foods that were used medicinally in Central Asia and also in China at that time. And after that, Chinese medicine and food lore um, branched in a different direction. You start getting the New World food crops coming in. And that, again, is another story. And since I want to leave time for questions, I'll leave that story for you know next time I come up here. But that's kind of fun, too. One of my former students, Suchi Damazimdar, has just done a really neat article on the coming of food plants, of the Western food plants to China. So I'll leave it at that. So thank you very much. So if you have any questions. Yeah. We can, yeah, we can have a few questions. Then after this, we have reception follows. So you're uh, welcome to stay and also, of course, continue to speak and uh, uh, asking questions to Professor Anderson. I have first one over here. Okay. Hello, Professor Anderson. Wonderful talk. Um, my question centers around wheat. Um, I'm not familiar with the location in which wheat was first cultivated or domesticated. Mm -hmm. When um, did it arrive in China, and how does that timing fit with the domestication of wheat in Western civilization? Uh, it's been quite narrowly nailed down to uh, southeast Turkey, uh, maybe spilling over into Syria, but basically southeast Turkey at about 9500 BC. Uh, it gets to China around 2000 BC. And it gets across Central Asia. You can see a steady spread. It goes about 1,000 miles per 1,000 years, uh, about a mile a year. And uh, it spread along the Silk Road, which, of course, wasn't a Silk Road at that time, but the, the route that later became the Silk Road. Uh, barley also, sheep and goats also. I, I suspect this is a similar question, and I'm going to leap right into it, of course, uh, the import of Western food. Yeah. But when did uh, the spicy peppers hit Sichuan, and what route did that come in by? Uh, it, they came with the Spanish and Portuguese into Macau and, and uh, probably elsewhere. They're probably also Portuguese sprung, bringing them to India and then coming across the Himalaya to uh, Sichuan. And we don't know when because our information on exactly when the New World food crops came to the back blocks of China is just absolutely terrible. I mean, people have looked, the information isn't there. Uh, nobody's going to report when somebody first got a chili pepper. But they're already common and established all over South China by the 1700s. I'm pretty sure they were there by 1600. They, shot, they slotted into the Hunan Sichuan cuisine because uh, Hunan especially had already developed a highly spicy cuisine with lots of uh, smart weed and the Chinese brown pepper and sagebrush and other very sharp pungent herbs. And long pepper was used a lot and they loved that stuff. So chili pepper slotted right in. Uh, hello, Professor. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I'm a Chinese uh, visiting scholar here. So, uh, thank you for giving us a, a perfect uh, presentation. Yeah, it's right. you, uh, like we Chinese people, know more about our uh, Chinese food history. It's amazing you know more about uh, about Chinese food history. Uh, so, uh, my first question question is: How can you do that? You uh, like to read some Chinese um, histories, or you must have some Chinese friends, maybe. And uh, another question is, you know, uh, in this year's Chinese government uh, uh, pay more uh, much attention to the food safety yeah. uh, uh, problems. True. You know, uh, really there are many uh, food safety issues and food safety problems. Right. So, uh, in your opinion, uh, how can uh, solve this problem? And uh, uh, so, I mean, how, how to solve this problem? And yeah. could you please tell us about the food safety about the United States? Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, probably not the food safety, but I'll take the other question. <laughs> I am terrible at languages. I read Chinese enough to check translations so that I know they're not grossly wrong. I mostly use translations. 
I work with Paul Buell, who is as brilliant at languages as I am terrible at them. He reads 20 languages fluently. Uh, if he takes care of the serious Chinese, uh, I can backstop enough to correct him when he makes mistakes, and I can do the same with the other translations. There's been a really exciting lot of these Han Dynasty texts that I'm talking about coming out in really, really good scholarly editions and translations in the last 10 to 20 years. And that's, where I'm really, that's what I've really been mining lately. Uh, as far as food safety goes, yeah, there's a huge amount of concern about food safety in China and in the United States. And I am much less confident to talk about that than a, a very large number of professors here at Davis. So I'll merely say, yeah, I know, there's problems. <laughs> Okay, the questions are very serious. Let me ask you a fun question. Do you have a preferred Chinese food? A, fa uh, a favorite Chinese food? Yes. Oh, good heavens, no, there's thousands. I mean, <laughs> it's like the, you know, learning is like chicken feet. There's always another Chinese dish that's better than the last one. <laughs> Okay, uh, please join me to thank Prof. Oh, sorry. Um, one okay, more. last one. Yeah. One more. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm. I'm. Uh, since you didn't bring it up, uh, I thought I'll take that uh, this opportunity. What are the modern vegetables you were talking about that were were brought over to China that we now, you know, I'm just trying to get an idea. Well, the the first wave was chili peppers, tobacco, which is hardly a vegetable, but it spread fastest of anything. Um, maize, maize was picked up very rapidly, sweet potatoes, uh, peanuts. Later you start getting uh, tomatoes, guavas, uh, all kinds of stuff. And then most recently some really, you know, like I've been working more with the Maya Indians of Mexico for the last 30 years than with Chinese until recently when I switched back to China. And I'm amazed to find Maya Indian cultivate cultivated foods in China. Uh, the, the dragon fruit or fire dragon fruit, that's a cactus fruit that the Maya domesticated. Now, how they, I don't know how it got to China. There's a, a fruit called the yellow sapote, which is a Maya domesticate, um, and so forth. I mean, all, everything is coming to China now. Avocados, things like that. So there's... Um, it's quite a recent development, because if you look at Lee Shurchin's famous herbal from Lee Shurchin's famous herbal from 1593, he doesn't really mention any new world food, uh, any new world plants at all. So in, in, 1590, in 1593, these things were not salient enough to get into the major herbal encyclopedia of the time. But since then, they've exploded. Okay, I know when we have a wonderful presentation like this, the time passed so quick, right? It's not too bad, we can continue outside. So before yeah. that, pr please join me to thank Professor Anderson for his wonderful lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs>